Hello, everyone, and welcome to the latest in our spring 2020 KNEB webinar series from Woods Hole Research Center. I'm Heather Goldstone, Chief Communications Officer. And uh, as we've been doing since mid-March, we welcome you to these webinars uh, from our homes, my home here in Falmouth, Massachusetts, uh, near where Woods Hole Research Center is based. For those of you who are not familiar with Woods Hole Research Center, we are an organization of renowned scientists uh, working with a global reach and with a global network of partners uh, to enable us to study the most consequential ecosystems on Earth and to do science that is not only societally relevant, but that is really uh, geared from the beginning for maximal so social impact for being able to inform policy around climate change. We're really glad to have you with us. And I think you're really going to love the presentation that we uh, have for you today with Dr. Jen Francis, a senior scientist at the center who has really pioneered research connecting climate change in the Arctic, uh, which is something that we heard about in the uh, previous webinar two weeks ago as well, to extreme weather around the globe, including hurricanes, which uh, are increasingly on our minds here and for that matter in the international headlines. Uh, you know, we are expecting the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration to be releasing their outlook for the Atlantic hurricane season. Uh, any time now, but we've already seen forecasts from other groups coming out in uh, recent days and recent weeks, and all of them point to hurricane activity above normal. And that is related to climate change. Uh, we can say that at this point. And uh, earlier this week, we even saw a new analysis coming out showing that the likelihood of major hurricanes has increased by about 8% per decade over the past few decades as a result of climate change. And of course, uh, while we are still anticipating the beginning of hurricane season in the Atlantic, uh, we of course also have our eyes and our thoughts on India and Bangladesh, where Cyclone Ampan made a landfall earlier today, where millions have been evacuated and that in the midst of a pandemic. And that uh, cyclone we know is fueled by record high water temperatures in the Bay of Bengal right now. So uh, a very timely presentation by Dr. Jen Francis coming up today. Before we actually get to that, as we've been doing in these webinars, because it can be uh, a slightly odd experience to be on uh, the guest end of a webinar. It's not like uh, walking into an auditorium and being able to see everyone around you. I'd love to just get a sense and uh, help you get a sense of who else is here in this webinar with you. We currently have 219 participants. Uh, we had a, a few, well, we still have a few more people joining us. We're up to 220 now. Um, I think we may be suffering at least in the Northeast uh, at the hands of a truly gorgeous spring afternoon for which I can't blame anyone. Um, but believe me, it'll be worth your time to be here for, for Jen's presentation today. Um, I'm going to pop up a little poll because we'd like to get to know a little bit more about you. Um, and uh, easy questions, I promise. First question, let us know how old you are. I saw some names in the, uh, uh, the participant list uh, that would suggest we have some students with us today, and I'm seeing that coming up in the poll data. Uh, we've got about three quarters of you have voted so far, so I'll give it a little bit longer before I actually close it down. But uh, but the numbers are staying pretty steady here. We've got about 55 percent uh, in the 65 or older uh, t age range, uh, about 17 percent in the 51 to 65 age range. 8%, and I'm going to go ahead so that you can see these as I rattle off these statistics and uh, end this and, and share the results here. Um, about 7 or 8% of you each in, the, in your 20s, 30s, 40s, and then about 14% of our participants today are under 18 students. Really welcome to you and thank you for taking the time to be here and welcome to some of our local students. It's great to see you with us today. Now I'm going to ask you one other thing. Um, which is going to become, we've asked this a few times uh, in previous webinars, uh, but we'd like to get a sense of where you're joining us from. 
And let's see if I can uh, get to poll number two and, and let you answer this question. Where do you live and where are you joining us from? Um, because I think you're going to want to know where Jen Francis is joining us from uh, in a few minutes, and we will talk about that. But let us know where you're joining us from today. And we do have, uh, as usual, a uh, preponderance of you joining us from the U.S. Northeast and Canada, hovering at around 77% of you. We'll wait for a few more people to vote here before I close this out. And uh, call these the results, but most of you from the US Northeast and Canada. Uh, here, I'll go ahead and end. We've got 200 votes, so I will go ahead and, and close this and share with you uh, most from the Northeast and from Canada, but also some uh, strong representation from uh, the Western side of the US, several from Europe, uh, one person uh, saying Asia and the Middle East, likewise another from Central or South America. So we are so glad to see you joining us from around the world. And that really is one of the great benefits of these webinars. Um, while we miss our in-person events, it really is great to be able to uh, reach out to those of you in places where we wouldn't normally be having those in-person events. Now, I said that you were gonna wanna know where Jen Francis was joining us from. And so I'm going to now uh, invite Jen to join us on video. And um, ask you, Jen, where are you joining us from today? <laughs> yes, hello, everyone. And thank you so much for being here. And thank you, especially to the Canib family for supporting these webinars. Um, so my husband and I live on a sailboat for eight months of the year. And uh, right now we're in the US Virgin Islands, which isn't where we had planned to be. Um, the virus has affected us uh, just as much, I think, although we're probably in a better spot than, than some people. Um, we expected to be down in the island of Curacao by now, where we were expecting to haul our boat out for the summer because uh, Curacao is so far south, right off the coast of South America, that hurricanes rarely get there. So it would be a good safe place to leave it while we went home to Massachusetts for the summer. So. Anyway, we are planning to sail home instead because um, all of the islands around in the Caribbean are all closed to, um, to boats arriving from somewhere else. And so we really don't have much choice at this point, which is, um, you know, that's the way it goes. And we feel very fortunate compared to a lot of people um, dealing with this crazy situation that we find ourselves in. Well, Jen, we're glad that you could join us and uh, the wonders of modern technology that you've got Wi-Fi on your boat as you move around. <laughs> so we're, we're glad that you can join us um, from where you are now. And I, I would love, before you jump into your presentation, um, uh, I should tell our attendees that I, I've known Jen for, for several years, um, but it wasn't until very recently that I learned um, how integral this sailing part of your life is actually um, to how you ended up in Arctic research, uh, going back to sailing around the world uh, a couple of decades ago. Would you tell us a little bit of that story and, and how sailing led to your interest in the Arctic? <laughs> sure, so um, yeah, back in the early 80s, um, my husband and I, who wasn't my husband yet at the time, um, spent five years sailing around the world before we had finished school, before we owned a home, before we had children, any of that stuff. Um, and remember back in the 1980s, there was no GPS, there were no cell phones. Um, it was a very different experience back then. So it was all by celestial navigation um, and much more difficult. Um, and we took a very unusual route around the world. Um, a lot of high latitude sailing, including around Cape Horn and the Falkland Islands, but also up to the Arctic. And when we got to the Arctic, at that point, I had pretty well decided to change my career from what it had been, which was on the path towards becoming a dentist, uh, to going into meteorology, which was uh, something that had always fascinated me, but I never thought that it would, would be a career. Um, so. Towards the end of the trip, we went up to the Arctic, we were up in the islands of Svalbard, Spitsbergen, which is about 500 miles from the North Pole. And the weather information that we could get up there was literally worthless. Um, it was 
you know, we just had no idea what was coming any given day. So I decided that that was probably a good place to focus my meteorological interest because clearly there was a big need. <laughs> and so when I did go back to school and start pursuing uh, my career in meteorology and then atmospheric sciences, um, that's what I ended up focusing on. So you just never know. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's a great story for everyone and especially for the students uh, with us today to hear how life and careers uh, evolve in unexpected ways. So thank you for sharing with that with us. Um, I, no I guess at this point, without further ado, I uh, would love for you to, to launch into your presentation and help us understand a little bit more how things that seem as separate as warming in the Arctic and tropical storms might actually be connected and how climate change is, is pulling the strings on that, that connection. Can you see my screen now, my presentation? Because that's what I see. I'm not seeing your screen share yet. Uh, if you have your slides up, if you hit share screen again at the bottom. Yeah, I'm not seeing that share screen, so. Um... I'll do it over again. All right. I don't know where it went, but yeah. it disappeared. Hopefully it's okay now. Looks oh, great good now. Yes? Okay, all right. Yep. Look okay then. So, yep, okay. So let's get into this um, topic that uh, Heather already introduced, this seemingly unrelated things like melting ice in the Arctic and how that might have anything to do with tropical storms and especially unruly tropical storms. So as I'm sure almost everyone on this uh, webinar realizes is that all the greenhouse gases we've been dumping into the atmosphere for the last um, over a hundred years now really has caused the globe to warm and this is just showing um, you know one of the many graphics you can find for 2019 and comparing the global temperatures to what it used to be like before the industrial revolution we like to say. And you can see that the entire globe is warmer than it used to be. Those numbers are all positive. But what I want you to focus on is way up in the north there, those bright pink colors, which is the Arctic, obviously. And the warming there is happening faster than anywhere else. And part of the story behind that extra warming up in the Arctic is tied to the fact that we've lost most of the sea ice that floats on the Arctic Ocean. So this animation that you're looking at here is looking down on the North Pole. I'm hoping my pointer works. There's Greenland there, there's Northern Canada, Alaska's over on this side, and Europe is over on the upper right. These colors represent the thickness of the ice floating on the Arctic Ocean. And the animation starts in the late 1970s and continues right up to almost the present day. The orange and yellow colors represent very thick ice, up to three, four, maybe even five meters thick. And the purpley colors are much thinner ice. And what you can see very clearly as we go through this animation over the last 40 years is that that thick ice is gone. And what we're left with is only very thin ice left in the Arctic. And that thin ice is much more susceptible to any strange winds or um, situate weather patterns that uh, let a lot of extra sun in or bring a lot of heat up from the southern latitudes. And so the sea ice now is extremely vulnerable to um, additional warming that's happening in the atmosphere. And it's also magnifying the warming. It's part of the reason why the Arctic is warming so fast. So that was the ice thickness. And now if we look at how the coverage of the ice has been changing. So in the upper right is what the sea ice looked like during the end of summer back in the late 1970s. And then down in the front here 
is the same look, but in September of 2012, about 35 years later. And these red colors here are showing you where the ice is gone. So not only have we lost the ice thickness, not only has the ice become so much thinner, but it's also covering a lot less area. And if you consider the thickness change in addition to this area change and calculate how the volume of the ice has changed just in these last 40 years, 75% of it is gone now. And it's just a huge change that's happened in really the blink of an eye in terms of the Earth's lifespan. So the result of this is, or one of them, is that because we've lost all of this very white ice, we now are left with open ocean, which is much, much darker. And that dark ocean absorbs much more of the sun's energy as it shines down during the spring and summer months. And the result of that is that we have this warming happening that I showed you in the beginning. And it also sets up what we call a feedback where we lose some ice, we absorb some more heat from the sun, it melts more ice so that more of that sun's energy can be absorbed. And so it sets up a vicious cycle. So this loss of sea ice and the loss of really what we call the Earth's mirror, you can think of as a threat multiplier because we are now absorbing, because the Earth is darker now, literally, because of we're losing all of this ice and snow too on land, we're absorbing a lot more of the sun's energy and that's making global warming even worse by a lot, 25 to 40% more global warming than if we didn't have that ice there. And this is causing the glaciers in the Northern Hemisphere and Greenland, the Greenland ice sheet, to both melt much faster. And this is contributing to sea level rise. So you can think of this loss of ice in the Arctic and the warming that's happening up there as a threat multiplier. And because of this, we're putting more heat in the atmosphere. So we've increased the greenhouse gases, more heat's being absorbed by the earth and the globe is warming. Five of the last um, 10 years, the most recent five years are the hottest five years. We're already bumping up pretty close to that target that the Paris Accord was trying to meet, which was 1.5 degrees Celsius warming for the globe. We're already almost there. And the loss of the ice in the Arctic is making these bars even taller than they would be otherwise. So more heat in the atmosphere, more heat in the oceans. We know that about 90% of the heat trapped by greenhouse gases actually goes into the oceans and not the atmosphere. And what you're looking at here is actually the um, ocean surface temperatures from about 10 days ago um, and their differences from normal for this time of year. And what you can see is those orange and yellow colors stretching all the way across the tropical Atlantic area are bad news. And that's what, why we're here talking about tropical cyclones is that all that warm water sitting there is like energy for those storms. And you can see it extends all the way into the Bahamas and into the Gulf of Mexico. So this is one of the ways that, um, that fuels these tropical storms and having all that warm water there means that when one forms, it's going to have plenty of energy to work with. We already had our first tropical storm just this last few days, uh, tropical, sto tropical storm Arthur, which formed just south of Florida and made its way up towards um, Cape Hatteras. So we're not even in the hurricane season yet. That starts June 1st. So we can also see that over time, that heat that's been absorbed by the oceans, the upper half of the ocean roughly, has been increasing dramatically over the last several decades. So this is just showing the heat content of the upper 2,000 meters of the ocean and how that's increased so much over these re recent times. So the third aspect of this is that we also have more moisture in the atmosphere now. So we've got more heat in the air, more heat in the ocean, and we have more moisture in the atmosphere. This is an animation of the amount of water vapor in the atmosphere from last summer, so during hurricane season last summer. And if you look carefully, you can see Hurricane Dorian spinning over the um, Bahama chain right there. And there's a couple of other tropical storms out in the Pacific. 
So you can notice very clearly that the tropical regions here of the earth are where there's the most moisture. And that's partly why we find uh, such severe storms happening there. That moisture is like fuel for these storms. But this is also a really fun um, animation to look at different aspects of it and see how these tendrils of moisture are sucked up into the higher latitudes by extratropical storms, so not tropical storms. So over time, we are seeing that the amount of moisture in the atmosphere has been steadily increasing as we would expect it to. With the oceans warming more, they're evaporating more moisture into the air, and as the air warms, it can hold more of that moisture. So we're seeing a very, very steady increase in that atmospheric moisture. So pulling in this all together and connecting it to hurricanes, that heat and that moisture, as I said, are fuel for storms, not just tropical storms, but all storms. But we're talking about the tropical ones here. So other aspects of this, as I already alluded to, were the fact, is the fact that we're increasing sea levels. The Arctic is playing a role here through that extra warming that it's causing globally, but also helping to melt the ice sheets of Greenland and also melting the glaciers on land. So the, the sea level rise is being caused by several factors. The biggest one lately over the past several decades has been the melting of those land glaciers. But also this other big contrib contribution is just because of the fact that the oceans have been absorbing all that extra heat. And when the oceans get warmer, they expand. And that's what's known as thermal expansion. The other two factors are melting ice sheets, both from Antarctica and from Greenland. And these contributions are the ones that are increasing the fastest. And the Arctic, as I said, is accelerating that melting process. And what you might not know is that sea level rise is not happening uniformly around the world. These, uh, this is showing the trends over the last few decades. Um, and these red colors are where sea level is rising quickly and there's even some areas where sea levels are going down. Um, and you can see that right along the East Coast here, where we're located, is one of the places that's uh, experiencing faster than normal sea level rise. And there's many factors that contribute to that, but we are definitely in one of the places where it's rising the fastest. And those rising seas, of course, are connected to hurricanes by causing larger storm surges because as the storms come ashore, they're riding on a higher ocean level, so that surge can extend farther inland. And also the storm waves are riding on a higher ocean as well, so those waves will damage structures farther inland. So the last connection to hurricanes is really getting closer to my own research, which is the disruption of the winds that steer storms. And what we're finding is that there are, again, the Arctic is playing a role here. One of the things that's happening is because the Arctic is warming so fast, it's causing the steering winds around the Northern Hemisphere to weaken. And it's because the difference in temperature between the Arctic and areas farther south um, is the, the really the force that drives those steering wheels, uh, steering winds. And so as the Arctic warms much faster, that difference in temperature is getting smaller. And so there's less force to drive those upper level steering winds. We're also seeing that the jet stream, which is this river of wind high over our heads, is becoming wavier as a result of, these, of Arctic warming so much faster. And I'll show you an example of that in a sec second. And those bigger waves in the jet stream tend to move more slowly. And because they move more slowly, the wind, the, the uh, weather that they, they are generating and also the weather they're steering is also moving more slowly. There's been recent research suggesting that hurricanes have been moving more slowly and more uh, are tending to stall in one place. And we've seen some great examples of that lately. So here's what I mean by a wavy or jet stream. This is actually the jet stream that was in place when Sandy came along back in uh, October of 2012. You can see this very large snaky thing over the Northern, uh, North America here. These waves are very large for the jet stream. These are, this is the core of the winds in the jet stream. And when these waves get big like this, that pattern tends to stay in place for a long time. And you can see that the winds south of the jet stream are very weak. So when Sandy came along, there was very little 
um, in the way of winds to steer it. And it ended up, as we know, going into the coast of New Jersey. So there have been some very unruly tropical storms lately. I just wanted to show you a couple of examples. Um, we mentioned Irma already. It was unruly because it was so strong. Um, Irma came through the part of the world where I am right now, which is the US Virgin Islands. And we can still see a lot of uh, evidence of the damage that it caused here. It then continued on up into Florida and dumped almost or over 20 inches of rain in some parts of Florida and did a lot of damage there as well. We'll all remember Hurricane Harvey, how unusual that situation was. Harvey was one of those stalling storms that came in over the Gulf of Mexico. You can see these, this is the ocean temperature differences from normal over the Gulf of Mexico when Harvey arrived in Houston, much warmer than normal temperatures, a lot of evaporation, a lot of moisture in the atmosphere, and very little in the way of winds to move it along. And so it came into Houston, it stayed in one place for several days, and you can, I don't know if you can see these numbers, but there's over 40 inches of rain dumped in very flat Houston, and the residents of Houston were not pleased. Florence was a similar situation where the storm came along and then reached the coast of the Carolinas and just stopped in place, and as a result, dumped over 20 inches of rain in this area of the Carolinas and the eastern seaboard. And then there was Dorian very recently, uh, one of these storms again that came along and just stayed in one place. It was also an extremely strong storm, a category five as it sat over the northern Bahamas here, and it just demolished the neighbor, the communities in the northern Bahamas. They are still trying to recover from that terrible uh, storm that hit them two summers ago. So um, Heather's already alluded to the fact that um, this summer, most or uh, all of the predictions that have come out so far agree unanimously that it is going to be a very busy year for tropical storms in the North Atlantic. Um, the factors that contribute to that, as I've already shown you, the ocean temperatures are abnormally warm, very warm all across the areas where the, the hurricanes tend to develop in the tropical Atlantic. And then once they get over to Florida and into the Gulf of Mexico, there's plenty of energy there for the storms to feed off of as well. There's no sign of an El Nino forming. Um, it isn't there now and there's really no expectation for it. And the reason we care about that is because when we do have an El Nino, it tends to create a lot of shear in the winds over the Atlantic side. So even though El Nino is in the Pacific, it tends to cause, uh, it affects the shear over the tropical Atlantic. And shear is, is bad for storms. It tends to rip them apart. It prevents them from forming and tends to keep them from getting very strong. So no El Nino is actually bad news for us. We're also seeing a very low amount of sea ice up in the Arctic already this spring and very warm temperatures. So these, this is showing the temperatures from just last week up over the Arctic running 10 to 15 degrees above normal. So again, thinking back to what I mentioned, how the very warm Arctic is affecting the steering winds um, of the storms, this is also probably going to be playing a role this summer. So that's pretty much what I have for today and looking forward to questions. But if you would like to do a bit more reading, I have two articles that I wrote recently for Scientific American magazine. One of them is more focused on the Arctic itself, but all the ways that the Arctic meltdown is affecting weather patterns. And that one came out in April 2018. And this other one called Rough Weather Ahead is a more general look at how uh, climate change is, is causing various types of extreme weather to become more frequent. So with that, I look forward to some questions. Terrific. Thank you so much, Jen. If you want to uh, go ahead and stop your screen share um, for the Q&A, and um, we already have a number of questions uh, that people have submitted. Uh, just a little uh, point of, of order here. If you have questions for Jen, we would like to get as many of those to her as possible. And the best way to do that is for you to type your question into the Q&A um, instead of raising your hand or putting something into the chat. I'll primarily be looking to the Q&A um, section. Uh, so if you're looking down at the bottom of your Zoom screen, 
that little thought bubble Q&A uh, icon, go ahead and type your question in there and we will see how many of these questions we can get to. I wanted to, to go back uh, to one point, Jen, that you made about sea level rise. Two points that I think are often um, underappreciated. Uh, one, that it's not happening evenly everywhere, but mm -hmm. also just how large the role of thermal expansion actually is. I mean, this is, you know, we're all familiar with the idea that if you boil a pot of water and you start with the pot too full, you know, you can boil over. Um, but we don't often think that, that uh, what seems like a relatively small change in temperature of the oceans could do something like actually expand the oceans enough to cause a change in sea level rise. Yeah, but when you look at that amount of ocean heat content and how it's changed over time, it's really just a phenomenal amount of heat. And, you know, water can absorb a lot of heat and not change its temperature too much. It, it has a very high heat capacity, we say. Um, but, you know, it, it's a lot of energy. There's a lot of heat that's been trapped by these greenhouse gases that we've been putting into the atmosphere and the other changes to the planet that we've been doing that have contributed to the warming. And so it's, it's, uh, it is a, a big component of, of sea level rise. And uh, it's being, it's, it's, uh, per, its proportion of the sea level rise is getting smaller and smaller though, as the contributions from Greenland and Antarctica ice melt are getting larger. Another thing that a, a couple of people noted in your presentation um, was the, the prominent role that you talked about moisture in the atmosphere. Mm -hmm. having. Um, and how that, as well as heat, can be fuel for storms. And, you know, okay, heat is a form of energy. That makes sense. Um, mm -hmm. But tell us a little bit more about how moisture acts as fuel for storms. And, and a couple of people have also asked if that moisture is important also, not just in weather, but, it, but in enhancing the greenhouse effect for the planet overall. Absolutely. Those are great questions. And I almost always say, that I think the moisture story is never told uh, well enough, often enough, with enough emphasis, because that extra moisture in the atmosphere plays a huge role. And as one of those questions alluded to, water vapor, so that's water that's been evaporated, it's a gas in the atmosphere, that is also a greenhouse gas. So it's another one of these positive feedbacks that's happening in the climate system. As we add carbon dioxide and methane and other greenhouse get gases to the atmosphere, get the warming started, that increases the evaporation from the ocean and it adds more water vapor to the atmosphere, which increases the heat trapping capacity of the air. So that's a very big deal. Um, but also that moisture uh, plays a big role in the storms because when you take water vapor that's evaporated from the ocean or from the land, and then you condense it into liquid, which would be clouds, there's a lot of heat that gets released during that process of condensation. And that goes into the air. It increases the heat that's in the atmosphere, say during a storm and when it's creating those clouds in the first place. And that helps fuel the upward motions in the storm that lead to things like thunderstorms and, and certainly stronger hurricanes. So um, it plays a huge role, not just in tropical storms, but all storms. And then finally, the third real big role of that water vapor is that it's providing more moisture for storms to dump on us. So we're already seeing the uh, frequency of heavy precipitation events all across the United States, but especially in the East, uh, becoming much more frequent. And I don't mean a little bit. We're talking about 50, 60 percent more heavy downpours in the Northeast and somewhat less as you go westward across the country. And you might uh, think look at the headlines today and see that two major dams in Michigan were broken because we've had this very persistent heavy rain falling in the Midwest um, pretty much all spring. Uh, they've really been saturated there and so they're looking at the biggest flooding they've ever seen um, in that part of the world and that's related to this extra moisture in the atmosphere because it's evaporating from warmer oceans. We, we have a lot of uh, questions that are focused on hurricanes because that's what your presentation focused on. And I want to um, go off on a little bit of a tangent for a moment because you just mentioned um, the situation in the Midwest with flooding. Um, mm -hmm. 
I mean, how broad are the impacts of Arctic warming on our weather? It's not just hurricanes, right? But it can be all sorts of, of different types of weather. And, and I think sometimes, um, you know, there can kind of be this reaction to say, well, how could climate change be connected to hurricanes and to snowstorms and to flooding and to droughts, all of these different things, how could they all be tied to, to one process? So can you give us a little bit of insight into that? Sure. So I alluded to it a little bit when I talked about those big waves in the jet stream. And um, when we weaken those upper level winds because of the Arctic warming so fast, we also make it more likely for those big waves to occur in the jet stream. Now those big waves are what create the weather that we experience down here on the surface, whether it's a, a beautiful, dry, sunny day or seeming like uh, storm after storm coming through your part of the country. So if those waves are getting bigger or they're, they're in a big configuration more frequently, those big waves, waves, as I said, also move much more slowly from west to east. And so what we're expecting and what we're starting to measure is a tendency for more persistent weather conditions. And this could be any kind of weather condition. So if you happen to be in, a, in the dry part of the, of the wave in the jet stream, then you're looking at a higher percentage or higher likelihood of, of droughts happening and also heat waves. But what's happening in the Midwest this, this winter is they're in the stormy part of one of those waves and it's been pretty stuck in place. Um, and so basically they've been under the storm track for most of the spring and having all of this precipitation dumped on them. So we think that the rapid Arctic warming is making these types of scenarios more likely. Um, and that's actually one of the things that I've been researching very actively uh, in the last year or two. I, I think uh, trying to understand how winds at different levels in the atmosphere affect each other and, and turn into these large scale patterns can be a lot to, to take on. I mean, if we were to think about the jet stream as a river, as rivers uh, you know, come down into flatter areas, they tend to meander more and slow down because they don't have as much gravity driving them. Exactly. Is that kind of the same thing that we're talking about with the jet stream? If it's kind of like a river through the atmosphere, it doesn't have that temperature gradient driving it and it starts to, to meander and slow down? Exactly. So as I said, when the Arctic is really cold and the temperature difference between the Arctic and areas farther south is really big, then we, we get a very strong jet stream. And that you can think of going to your analogy as being on the side of a mountain that's very steep. So you have a lot of force basically uh, creating that wind that becomes the jet stream. But when the Arctic warms much faster and that temperature difference gets smaller, then there's less force to drive those winds of the jet stream. And so that is similar to the, the river that came down that steep mountainside it's the coastal plain and then everybody, well, a lot of people who've flown in an airplane will uh, look down and see these very loopy looking rivers that are flowing through, say, a, a very shallow grade of land. And um, that is a very similar situation, yes. We've had a number of people ask for a little bit more information on El Nino. If you could tell mm -hmm. us, you, you mentioned that being a factor in what determines hurricane activity in the Atlantic. Um, mm -hmm. What is El Nino? How is it changing? Do we know how it's changing with climate change? And, and of course, how is it related to, to hurricane activity? If we're talking about a phenomenon in the Pacific, how is it related to Atlantic hurricane activity? Yeah, so I should have explained the El Nino a little better, obviously, because I saw a couple of questions pop up there. So El Nino is really just a, a natural uh, fluctuation in patterns of ocean temperature that happen um, off the coast, off the west coast of uh, Ecuador, so along the equator in the Pacific Ocean, uh, basically starting off of Ecuador and extending westward from there. An El Nino condition is when there's this tongue of much warmer than normal ocean temperatures that forms um, off of that coast. And it's called El Nino because when that warm water is sitting there off the coast, it tends to uh, stop the, the ocean from mixing in the vertical. And that mixing is really important because it brings nutrients up from deeper layers of the ocean, which fish feed on. 
And so when there's an El Nino, and they tend to occur around Christmas time, so that's why it, it got the El Nino, the sort of El Nino in Spanish would be the child um, related to the Christmas year, uh, time of year. Um, it shuts down their fisheries, so they have uh, very little to eat, and it's, it's a very dis a disturbing and um, disruptive event when it happens there. Of course, the opposite is a La Nina, and, and that is when there's colder than normal temperatures in that same general location. And the reason that it affects um, the Atlantic hurricane season is that whenever you have changes in temperature patterns, um, on the ocean or on the land, it changes the wind pattern. So winds are there because of temperature differences. And, um, and so when we mess with the temperature differences in the Pacific Ocean, or they change naturally, it's going to have downstream effects. And the downstream effect of an El Nino in the Atlantic is to create more um, it, it causes the wind to blow from different directions at different heights in the atmosphere. And that's what we call shear. That tends to be what keeps tropical storms from forming or ripping them apart if it's bad enough. And we don't really know how El Nino is going to change in the future. It's a, it's a really open research question right now. There's uh, not a lot of evidence for either La Nina's or El Nino's um, having a significant change so far. And I think the climate models are not that good at simulating um, some of these large scale ocean circulation patterns yet and temperature changes. I appreciate you bringing us right to the cutting edge of where the, the science is of us understanding what we do and don't understand about yeah. which is, is changing. Um, we've gotten a number of questions asking, uh, you know, going back to your initial uh, temperature change map. Um, mm -hmm. where you said, you know, temperatures are rising everywhere, but so much more extreme in the Arctic. And there was a little bit of a similar pinkish purple blob down near Antarctica, but you don't see the same sort of extreme warming um, at the southern pole as you do at the northern. So right. why is that? What's the difference? So there's a lot of factors, but the biggest one and the, the easiest one to understand is there is sea ice in the Southern Ocean around Antarctica, but every summer it tends to melt all the way back to the coast. Because the Southern, you know, Antarctica is a continent, whereas the Arctic is an ocean. And so because that sea ice melts back to the coast every summer, there's no opportunity for that feedback that I talked about where you lose some ice and then you absorb some more heat from the sun and then you melt more ice because the ice is already melted as far back as it can get. And once it gets to the coast, um, the ice that's sitting on top of Antarctica is very, very cold. It's very, very thick. And so it will take a lot of years of warming to melt that ice that's sitting on top of Antarctica, at least from the top. Um, where we're seeing the ice melting in Antarctica is actually from underneath. It's because the ocean is warming so much and it's bringing that warmer water underneath those glaciers that are coming off of the continent and sticking out into the ocean. So it's a very different place with very different processes happening. We have a, a very, I would say, astute and informed audience here giving us some really uh, challenging questions today, Jen. So here's Good. another um, wondering, as there's more moisture in the atmosphere, does that mean more clouds in the atmosphere? And what does that mean for climate and for storms? Yeah, so um, that's actually a pretty difficult question to answer. Um, clouds are very gnarly things. Um, different kinds of clouds have very different effects on the climate system. So, for example, low clouds that you're apt to see like off the coast of California or um, places where it tends to be pretty much nice weather, but you just get this layer of moisture sitting there, those clouds tend to cool the surface quite strongly. But if you look at clouds that are very high in the atmosphere, which are made of ice crystals, they let most of the sun's rays come right through, but they trap some of the heat, very, very similar to how a greenhouse gas works. And so they actually have a warming effect on the planet. 
and we are expecting to see more clouds as the um, as the atmosphere gains moisture in some places but it's not clear whether the clouds are going to cause more cooling overall or more heating overall although the rec most recent research is leaning towards contributing to the heating which is bad news we were all kind of hoping that oh maybe you know if we get more of those low clouds it'll actually be um, something that will help slow down global warming, but it's looking like that's not the case. And we got one question um, about the, the kind of feedback loop that you mentioned in the Arctic that um, as it, it gets darker and absorbs more heat and then it warms more quickly and, and you get this uh, vicious cycle. And, and one person asked if there's any way to, to interrupt or stop that, that vicious cycle. Well, there's certainly people um, proposing some ideas that uh, are aimed at that uh, possibility. Um, one of the ideas is to sprinkle very white particles onto the ice that's still there so that when the summer melt season comes along, um, the, the re reflectivity of that ice surface becomes higher. So it makes it uh, brighter and it reflects more of the sun's energy back to space which would reduce the amount that's being absorbed by the Arctic as a whole. Um, there are other ideas of putting very reflective particles up higher in the atmosphere. They could be salt particles, which would help create more clouds, which may or may not have a warming or a cooling effect, as I was just describing. Um, and there's other ideas about putting them up even higher in the atmosphere to just reflect some of the sun's energy. But um, all of those approaches, um, I think, are very short-sighted, uh, they'd be expensive, um, and if you ever stopped doing them, even if they started to work, if you ever stopped doing them, we're still left with the underlying disease, which is the fact that we're adding all these greenhouse gases to the atmosphere. So if we're not doing that, uh, if we're not mitigating those greenhouse gases at the same time that we try to do this geoengineering, as it's called, um, it's really, it's, it's not a, a long-term solution and it could cause some um, very detrimental effects that probably are very difficult to predict at this point. Effects on the ecosystem, the marine uh, biology, the food web in the ocean, um, changes in wind patterns. Um, it could cause, you know, severe weather to happen in places that they're not used to it and then, you know, they start blaming and it, it could it just can turn into a big mess really fast. So I am not a proponent of any of those ideas, but that doesn't stop people from thinking about them. We had one person ask, uh, how do we get this presentation that you've made today, Jen, and this information um, in front of our federal policymakers in Congress? And in fact, that's something you've done, right? You, you've gone to DC. So tell us a little bit about trying to get this information. <laughs> Uh, into the yeah. So I've actually been twice. Um, I testified at a Senate panel back in 2012, I think it was. Um, and then I testified again for a congressional um, committee hearing just last year. And the two experiences couldn't have been more different. So back in 2012, it was a very um, antagonistic environment in the room. Uh, there were you know, there were clearly people uh, that were still not convinced that climate change was something that humans had anything to do with, and they were asking very difficult, aggressive, uh, unhelpful questions. And um, the, but even more disappointing to me in that experience was the fact that nobody was listening to each other. So the the two sides of the of the story were just not paying attention to what the other side had to say. Um, so that was that was an interesting experience, but not very satisfying. Um, but when I testified for Congress uh, last year, it was a completely different story. Um, there really were very few questions that were, you know, what you'd expect from someone who didn't believe in climate change at all. And the discussion was really more about what to do about it. So I feel like we've made a lot of progress. I feel that the the Arctic story is a good one to tell to both public audiences and also policymakers because the Arctic is changing so fast that anybody can see that 
animation of the changing ice thickness and you know really be blown away and it's a very uh, convincing and, and obvious effect of, of global climate change. So I continue to try to get out in front of whoever is willing to listen and um, use this tool and the connection to extreme weather and people love to talk about weather. So combining those two into one story uh, seems to be gaining some traction. Well, I think that uh, message of optimism and movement in the right direction is a great note to end on. Um, and you've uh, been very obliging with, with all of the questions this afternoon. So just one last question for you um, from a concerned member of the audience. How long is it going to take you to get home? <laughs> um, not very long, actually. Um, of course, I, it's, there's a lot of pressure on me to, to produce the, a great weather pattern to get us home. So, you know, winds <laughs> from a good direction, not too much wind, no squalls, you know, making it easy. Um, but if things went really well, we could actually be home if we went nonstop in um, about six, seven days. All right. Well, we wouldn't want to rush you. Enjoy the U.S. Virgin <laughs> Islands uh, for as long as you're enjoying them. But we uh, do look forward to having you back in Woods Hole. But senior scientist Jen Francis, thank you so much um, for sharing all this information with us in such an engaging way. Um, we've had over 50 questions today and I know we didn't get to all of them, but thank you all for putting your questions out there and thank you, Jen, so much for answering so many of them. Happy to try. <laughs> And again, thank you all for joining us uh, for our webinar series. We will be back again in a couple of weeks uh, talking about faith and science coming together in climate action. And I would like to leave you with one last message that most of uh, the work that happens at Woods Hole Research Center is funded by a combination of, yes, grants from the federal government and also from foundations and also by donations. And so if what you have heard today has spurred you to want to get more engaged, to learn more and to support uh, this kind of work, we would encourage you to consider supporting Woods Hole Research Center's work. Thank you again so much for joining us for the webinar and we hope to see you again in a couple of weeks.